But if there's one thing we really enjoyed doing down on the bluff, that was eating. And uh, it almost seemed like as a church, we took every opportunity we could to have a bring and share, a bring and eat. Kind of make me, made me feel like that uh, little boy they interviewed the one time on the news channel. They're like, hey, so tell us, what do you like to eat? And he was like, chicken masala, chicken tikka, <laughs> butter chicken, roti. It was a white boy. <laughs> No, it wasn't. (laughs) But there comes a time in the interview, and they say, like, so tell us, what do you like to cook? And he's like, looks at the guy interviewing me, he's like, Dave, I don't cook, I eat. (laughs) In fact, when Sine and I moved up to Hillcrest, we actually had a few conditions. Roger's like, oh, no, I didn't hear about these conditions. (laughs) But the first one is that there had to be a McDonald's. Because for Sine and I, McDonald's was like our source of life on Friday nights after leading youth group. <laughs> only because it was actually the only place open. And uh, we didn't want to cook when we got home. Secondly, there had to be a BMS. Now, if you don't know what BMS stands for, that stands for Bluff Meat Supply. Yay! How many of you know Bluff Meat Supply? Hey, the famous butcher. But you know where the mothership is, Right? down on the bluff. And I've noticed you Hillcrest people don't like saying BMS. You need to get it right. Because down on the bluff, it's called BMS. (laughs) And lastly, now this one was, this one was huge. Now this, this, this last one was actually a deal breaker as to whether we were coming up here or not. Hillcrest needed to have an Oxford supermarket. (laughs) Now some of us really enjoy Oxford. I'm talking about Caleb and Aaron. I feel like we go there like two times a week. So Sine and I were really stoked when we knew Hillcrest had an Oxford supermarket. And now, because Hillcrest was the only other place that had one, and now I see Waterfalls also getting one, eh, James? Waterfalls also wanting to, uh, like Hillcrest, follow in the footsteps of the bluff. (laughs) It's about time. (laughs) But what makes Oxford so special, you might ask? What makes it worth raving about? Well... Our Oxford on the Bluff was quite a special Oxford because, and it had something that the Hillcrest Oxford doesn't have. And I I dream of the day when it will eventually happen, but back at the Oxford on the Bluff, you'd be shopping, and if you didn't know this, Tuesdays are like the days to go shop at Oxford because that's when they have the big specials, the big deals. And you would be shopping, you would be looking, wow, lamb's 100 rand a kg, wow. And, uh, but you'd be shopping and waiting in anticipation to hear one special voice come on over the intercom. And you just never know when it would grace you with its presence. But you'd be shopping, and then all of a sudden, you would hear this voice, and it goes, wow, wow, wow. <laughs> Our two specials. It's so nice, you don't have to think twice. And literally every five minutes or so, you would just hear this, wow, wow, wow. (laughs) And I just, I haven't got that same experience up here at Hillcrest. But maybe, maybe we should call her to come on up and give us a bit of wow action. But it's safe to say Oxford for me had the wow factor. But you know what else has even more of the wow factor? The kingdom of God. You know who else has even more of the wow factor? It's Jesus Christ himself. And friends, I've just got to say, lately I've been standing in awe of what God has been doing. Because he's been moving. Even as we've just been sharing tonight, looking back on this past week at the crusade, people have been healed, the lost have been saved. And I just can't help but find myself standing there in awe, going, wow, wow, wow. You go, God. Hey? Wow, wow, wow. (laughs) It's so nice, I don't think twice. (laughs) But guys, wow actually has a pretty big meaning for me personally. And uh, it's a bit of an acronym. And it doesn't stand for World of Warcraft like some of the younger folk might know it as. But the word wow actually stands for walking on water. It's the wow factor. Walking on water. Because in the kingdom of God, anything is possible. 
And as we go after the kingdom of God tonight, I pray that your hunger and thirst will increase and increase and that your faith will rise and rise in Jesus Christ, the bread of life. And talking about bread, nothing quite beats a freshly baked bread coming out of the oven, right? Are, we, are there a few of us on the same page as that? Like if you walk into a room and you smell a freshly baked bread, you're just like, I've got to get me some of that. Eh? Cut me a slice, slap on some butter and Nutella and cover me in sunshine, right? <laughs> eh? <laughs> it just puts us in this extremely happy state of life. We're just like, whoo, I think I'll have another. <laughs> and uh, there's just something so warm and friendly about it. And it actually got me thinking like, Jesus is the bread of life. What do you think heaven smells like? Sure. I'll let you decide for yourself. The little interesting, fun little topic. But friends, we are going to be hearing from the bread of life himself. Because if there's two things that just never get old, it's talking about Jesus and talking about his kingdom. Hey, would you guys agree? And uh, tonight we're really going to be diving in. Because even when Jesus sends out his 12 disciples, he sends them out and he says, go preach this one message. Tell them, repent, for the kingdom of God has come near. Hillside, friends, church, can I say repent for the kingdom of God has come near and his kingdom is here tonight. Do you agree? So we're going to have a look at our first scripture for the tonight and it's found in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 and it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Jesus on earth was the kingdom on earth. Jesus in you is the kingdom in you. Which is why if I had to ask you, what does the kingdom look like to you? What would you say? What do you see? What do you feel? Because quite simply put, the kingdom is the king's domain. And the key word in that scripture is, it's his. It's his kingdom and it's his righteousness. In other words, it belongs and is ruled by him. Because Jesus is our way through to the Father. He is the only way we get it to get to experience it here on earth. And if I had to ask you, does sickness exist in his kingdom? Does poverty exist in his kingdom? Does anxiety, stress, fear exist in his kingdom? If the answer is no, then should we be allowing it to dwell within us? The answer is no, friends. Because of he who lives in me, because of he who's given me authority to cast it out. Amen. Tonight, it's got to go. Yeah. Who agrees with me? Yeah. It's time. It's got to go. Because of he who lives in me, he who has given us authority. Come on, who's hungry? Yeah. Hey? Talking about the bread of life, who's hungry? Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to look at our second scripture and we're going to spend a bit of time at this one. And it's a parable of Jesus that he gave in Matthew chapter 13, if you want to turn there. The parable of the mustard seed and the yeast from verse 31. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all seed, when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed it into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables and I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. I will open up my mouth. When Jesus speaks, it's a pretty good time to listen, right? <laughs> and when he does, will we be willing to open up our hearts to receive? I love this parable for a few different reasons. And uh, the one being is that it talks about a man and it talks about a woman. It talks about a man who took plant, a seed and planted it, and it talks about a woman who took yeast and worked it. In other words, gents, the kingdom of God is for you. Ladies, in other words, the kingdom of God is for you. We all have access. 
How incredible is that? And the beauty about it is that all, the only requirement that it seems is faith in action. Because you see, faith is what gives us access. It is faith that is what allows us to make withdrawals of heaven, and action is putting that which we have received to use. The seed and the yeast both represent faith. Faith in who? In the King, Jesus Christ. And action is taking that faith and seeing just what God can do with it. Hey? Because you see, friends, the kingdom of God is what it is because it reflects Jesus in all of his glory. The righteousness is what it is because it reflects Jesus in all of his glory, which is why faith, even small faith, is so powerful because of he who it is placed in. Hey? So to put it quite simply, zero faith, zero yeast in God equals nothing. Because without him, you can do nothing. But have even small faith or small pinch of yeast in God, what do you get? The kingdom. In other words, you get any bit of breakthrough or the miraculous you can think of or imagine. Simple, right? <laughs> You're not convincing me. <laughs> but it is. And sadly, sometimes the simplicity of it scares us. But friends, if we get it right... How much breakthrough is just waiting for us in this world? So let's talk about the thing we don't always enjoy doing, shall we? And that is the planting and the working. Because if you've never planted a veggie garden or baked a bread, <laughs> you wouldn't know that there's a process that needs to take place before you can enjoy the reward. And sadly, friends, in many cases, I feel like so much of so many people, the church has treated Sundays like a grocery store to collect from, and as a result, have forgotten that faith is something that we practice and exercise in the week, in our homes, in our families, and even in the workplace. But if I only leave it for Sundays, I'm going to find myself feeling rather empty the other six days of the week. I'm going to find myself waking up grumpy. I'm going to find myself waking up feeling anxious, angry, fearful. But if every single day, I'm planting. If every single day I'm taking the yeast, the faith, and I'm working it into the dough, seeking first his kingdom, can grumpiness, can fear, anxiety exist? Can it? Or will all I have is the kingdom? Will I have life? Because you be the judge, friends. I'm not going to judge your own life, your own situation. What how did things go the last time you started, uh, stopped uh, reading your Bible for a few days? How did things go when you started neglecting your prayer life, when you weren't saying, your kingdom come, God? What happened last week, Wednesday, when a storm started brewing and you didn't first seek his kingdom? What happened? And please do not misunderstand me or get me wrong. <laughs> This isn't a matter of box ticking to ensure rewarding like works as our source of salvation. This is a matter of obedience, friends. This is something God has told us to do. Seeking first his kingdom was not a suggestion. <laughs> he told us to do that. And the reason he told us to do that was because he knew he is the reward. And because he is the reward, friends, whether I'm planting or I'm working, it isn't a burden because I'm, what I'm promised is a yoke that is easy and is light. Because he is the reward, I receive life. Hey, if you're feeling like it's a burden, friends, I think you're doing it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> because he is life. I don't know about you, but I want that life every single day. And the moment I'm feeling dead, I need to reevaluate how I started my day. And if it wasn't first him, then I can't complain to him. <laughs> but how much in the habit do we get of complaining? But that needs to shift now, friends. And tonight I want us to have a look at a story. And it's a story about a mom and her son. Because for them, things have gotten pretty tough because you see this woman was a widow without a husband 
and her son without a father. And to make matters worse, there was even a bit of a drought going on at the time, which resulted in the brook drying up, making water more valuable than gold, leaving almost no room for success, no matter how much skill or tricks of the trade the father would have imparted into his son. It almost seemed like all hope was lost. But say it with me, the kingdom. Unless the kingdom has a role to play. Because you see, this woman was at her last, friends. At her last emotionally, mentally, physically, definitely financially, and most of all spiritually. Which is why I'm not too sure if she prayed out. Because we, it doesn't tell us if she did in the story we're going to have a look at in the scripture. But one thing I have noticed is that when people are at their last, whether they want to or not, it's a part of their DNA, their nature, to cry out for a savior. And you'll see it and hear of it all the time. And maybe she did pray out. She said, God, I don't even know your name, but I need you. Maybe. And she would have prayed her prayer, and then she would have made her way out to the city gates because that's where a lot of the big trees were. In other words, a lot of branches that she wanted to collect to make one of her last meals, and as she's bending down with some of the last strength she has, she hears the voice of a stranger call out to her. And the voice of the stranger says, could you go and get me a small jar of water so that I might have a drink? Won't you go and get me a small jar of water so that I might go have a drink? Doesn't that sound familiar in a way? Doesn't this almost sound like a story of a Samaritan woman who found herself at a well one day at midday, sun burning her neck, the weight of society's judgment on her shoulders, all she can feel is alone, and she makes her way up to this well, and all of a sudden she hears the voice of a stranger, and that voice calls out to her saying, won't you give me a drink? The widow was talking to Elijah, and the Samaritan was talking to Jesus. <laughs> and I want us to have a look at this conversation Elijah has with this widow in 1 Kings, chapter 17. And uh, I just want to get my place. Um, from verse 10. It says, when, it's talking about Elijah, when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called out to her and asked, would you bring me a little water in jar so I might, have, I might have a drink? As she was going to get it, he called and bring me, please, a piece of bread. And this is her response. She says, as surely as the Lord your God lives, she replied. I don't have any bread, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little olive oil in a jug. I'm gathering a few sticks to take home and make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. For this lady, all she had was what? All she had was a handful of flour and a bit of olive oil in a jar. She was going to make a small loaf of bread and then to her, the next step was just to go and die. <laughs> Friends, to her, this was a picture of death. That's, that's what she saw. That's what she predicted happening. She was going to make that loaf, and then after that, there was nothing else. She was just going to die after that, her and her son. But I just see Elijah standing there, thinking to himself, maybe even grinned about it. He's probably thinking to himself, if only you did know the Lord my God. Hey, if only she did know. Because if there's one thing she shows us in this passage of Scripture is that she didn't really have a God to believe in. She didn't have someone who she placed her faith in. 
Even as we look at the Samaritan woman, if you go and read that story for yourself in John chapter 4, even she starts to have a little go at Jesus, starts talking about Jacob. If only she knew. If only she knew she was talking to the very man who stood at the top of that heavenly staircase as angels ascended and descended. If only both these ladies knew that faith, even small faith in the king of kings is enough to see breakthrough, is enough to see restoration. If only they knew. (laughs) To her, her picture of death was the small loaf of bread and sharing it with her son for one last time. She didn't think for one second that her last day could be the start of a new one. Because you see, friends, we're talking about what tonight? We're talking about the kingdom. But it's not just any kingdom, it's his kingdom. In other words, Jesus can take what was her picture of death and turn it into a picture of life. Because he is the bread of life. You see, he can take the oil that, anoint, the oil that anoints because he is Christ, the anointed one. She's, gonna, she's about to have one last meal with her son. How about just one encounter with our heavenly father's son who saves? How about you drop your dismal sticks because he picked up the cross? <laughs> if it's fire you need, don't worry. That's been taken care of, which is why I'd like to introduce you to the Holy Spirit. Friends, can I say something? The Holy Spirit was there that day. (laughs) The Holy Spirit was there that day. If only she knew though, right? So Elijah had to help her out. Sorry, I see I closed my Bible, but I need to go back there. Let's just keep reading, uh, reading from verse 13. It says, then Elijah said to her, don't be afraid. Go home and do as uh, you have said, but first make a small loaf of bread for me from what you have and bring it to me and then make something for yourself and your son. For this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, the jar of flour will not be used up and the jug of oil will not run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the land. She went away and did as Elijah had told her. So there was food every day for Elijah and for the woman and her family. For the jar of flour was not used up and the jug of oil did not run dry. I don't know about you, friends, but that is a wow, wow, wow moment. It's so nice, I don't think twice. Hey, (laughs) Friends, what is possible when we first seek his kingdom? You know what that that phrase, what what passage of scripture that's from, that's, that's when Jesus is teaching us and telling us not to worry. That's when he says that. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And part of the things he actually lists and not to worrying about, one of them is food. Don't worry about it. And the other big one is he says, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has troubles all of its own. (laughs) Because you see, friends, for our widow friend in 1 Kings, every day she would have had to have put this faith thing to use and practiced it. She would have had to have put worry aside and every day she would have needed to have taken another handful of flour and poured a bit more oil without the fear of it running out tomorrow. Because the truth is she needed to eat, and in other words, she needed to live. Because if she didn't practice this, she would have just ended up where she was in the first place, with nothing. If she was too scared to try, she would have just ended up dying, like she predicted. And the thing is, friends, so do we. We also need to eat, and we also need to live. But won't you first seek his kingdom? Because when you do, I promise you wholeheartedly, you'll experience fullness to the max. Fullness in abundance. And the reason I can say that so boldly is because we as believers do not measure fullness by what we can see in the jar. We measure fullness by Christ who lives in us. 
because this will look quite sad if I focus on this, right? She's like, I only got one more left. <laughs> but if I focus on he who lives in me, friends, anything's possible. The jar of flour won't run out. And the oil in the jug will not run dry. Because he is abundantly just outpouring himself. Because his kingdom has no limit. Absolutely no limit. Friends, we need this. Because as you know, firsthand, troubles will come. <laughs> and like we like to say, we, we aren't promised a life without them. But they will come. And they even came for our, the widow. Because if you go and read the rest of the story, it says not too long after, her son actually falls ill and ends up dying. To the point where she even turns to Elijah and she says, did you come here to remind me of my sin and kill my son? This is after she's experienced this whole multiplication process. <laughs> and it's because of that, she, it shows us that, uh, well actually, sorry, before I get there, so Elijah actually takes her son, cries out to God, prays over the boy, and the boy gets raised to life. He wasn't sick and got healed, he was dead and got raised to life. Once again, the Holy Spirit was in the room. <sighs> Holy Spirit's been there since the very beginning, even hovering over the waters, and he's here tonight. And after her son gets raised to life, I like her response. <laughs> she says, now I know that you are a man of God, and what you say is true. <laughs> it's like the previous multiplication wasn't enough. Now I know. <laughs> it shows us that uh, she was still a bit on the edge of the empty jars that surrounded her, which had molded her identity over so many years. But friends, if God would do this for her, how much more do you think he can do for his church that seeks and pursues his presence on a daily basis? How much more? Hey? Abundantly more. You see, friends, we practice faith in the calm so that we can learn to stay calm in the storm. Hey? Isn't that good? We practice faith in the calm so that we can learn to stay calm in the storm. Because the storms do come, troubles do come. But if we seek first his kingdom, it can be overcome. <laughs> and for Sine and myself, we've actually been walking this journey for a little while now of having to practice and exercise faith. Because if there's one, one thing we've really been pursuing, and that's as our first child. <laughs> and uh, it's, we can probably say it hasn't gone quite according to plan just yet and so easily questions can rise like why how come or anything like that worry stress can start to creep in friends but can i tell you every day we seek his face which is why we confidently say we still believe it's going to happen for us it, it's not a there, there isn't doubt in sanana we know it's going to happen and that one day there will be a baby cholton <laughs> running around here <laughs> Roger wants lots of Charltons running around. <laughs> I'm, I'm just calling on all of you as babysitters, all these six figures. <laughs> but friends, our faith is strong because we believe in him and he is faithful. In his kingdom, there's breakthrough. Pursuing and practicing faith every day, friends, makes you strong. And I want to come back to that parable quickly because it's, 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 a, it's a good detail not to miss out on. Where it says, uh, he told them still another parable, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked all through the dough. Let me tell you, 60 pounds of flour is no joke when you're baking bread. 
And, uh, and Jesus was very strategic because he used that specific one with the woman. <laughs> I don't know how many ladies here have baked bread using 60 pounds of flour here in the room. But they say that's equivalent to about 50, plus minus, fit between 50 and 60 loaves of bread, which can feed to plus minus 100 people. You might feel like you don't have the strength to impact this world, but let me tell you, there's 100 people just waiting to feed on that which you have to give them. But it requires you to put that faith to use. Because you can have it, but are you working at it? Are you, are you working it into the dough so that people can be fed by it? So that you can be fed by it? Hey, friends. Jesus also says in Matthew chapter 5, part of the Beatitudes, verse 6, he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. For righteousness, for they will be filled. Whose righteousness? His righteousness. Romans chapter 1, verse 17. For in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. Just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. Doesn't say it will collect faith on Sundays. It says it lives by it. That means every day you open your eyes and take your first breath into the new day, it means you're living by faith. And you're seeking first his kingdom. Hey. Who's ready? I asked you if you're hungry for more. Are you still hungry for more? Well, then I think it's about time we pray. Because like I said, when you pray and go after the kingdom, oh, who knows what could happen? But let me tell you, it will be fullness. Because he is the definition of fullness, Jesus Christ. So can we stand together? Beth, if you can go play the keys for me, please. And friends, before we, we pray for each other, I don't want to miss the opportunity to ask if there's anyone here that hasn't received Jesus as their Savior, as the bread of life, as their source of life here tonight. We can't miss this opportunity. <laughs> we can't miss a glorious opportunity of heaven applauding you. <laughs> so if there is anyone here tonight, can I just ask right now to please raise your hand so that we can pray for you. If you've never received Jesus as your Savior, if we all have, that's great. But if there is someone, we cannot miss this opportunity. Hmm. We're all saved, glorious. <laughs> and secondly, you can start playing for me, please, Beth, if possible. Secondly, I'd love for us to, I'm going to call up on my leaders, my friends, and we're going to pray for people tonight. Because the Holy Spirit is here. I don't know if you've been feeling dry. I don't know if you've been feeling like you're at your last thread to the point of even death. But I want to tell you, Jesus can take that picture that you've made up in your own head and he can turn it right around. And he can turn it into a picture of life here tonight.